to meet you, Josh. Uh, nice to meet you, Dan. So, I think I'll start off, like, kind of some easy questions just to ease us into it. And then, um, you know, just see where, see where it goes. Um, but this is my first time doing, like, a remote recording ever. So, I'm, like super super interested to see how this comes out um thank you for doing okay this, by the way i like really appreciate it oh yeah thanks for having me um so i guess let's i want to start like just how did you get into like glass blowing as your primary medium yeah i went to i went to tyler school of art i studied sculpture and then i switched to become a glass major because um well, it's at, I first took my first glass blowing class because it looked really fun and interesting, but then I got hooked because glass blowing is like extremely difficult, um, and but if you focus on it and you work hard, you can see like the progress happening very very quickly, and for me anyway, that can be very addicting to like see yourself constantly improving. Um, yeah, it's like the and then. Have you ever tried it? I haven't. It's something I've been like very interested in, but like never had um, the facilities to like. Mm -hmm. Obviously, like I know I could like take a class. I've been, uh, I'm in the city, but um, yeah, no, I've I've never given it a shot. Like that and ceramics are like the two mediums I've like never actually like put my hands on. Yeah, I mean, but you hit the nail right in the head. Like it is instant gratification. Like you. It's a fast thing, you know, and a lot of people ask me, one of the most common questions I get is how long does this piece take you? And I'm always so self-conscious to, to say because, like, if a piece takes two hours, it's a long piece, you know? Most pieces take an hour or less. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you've really got it, like, down to a science then, if you've got it, like, uh, just at least in terms of, like, shaping the bags, I'm sure you've, like, really figured out like the process for like getting that like hollow um hollow section out like in the middle um yeah <laughs> yeah yeah i guess so yeah i do um i'm still playing around with different methods of doing it though just because i i'm always constantly like trying to explore and develop new new methods mm -hmm. um but yeah i've got i got my system down for that for sure cool so i mean like you just like stumbled into the, the glass shop at college um what so you're in undergrad for sculpture what was like um what was undergrad like for you Did, was it like a very like supportive and like nurturing learning environment um yeah it was i mean i was a really really bad high school student um i was like not <laughs> i was a horrible high school student and then i think like when I got into college, I like made a conscious decision to like try harder and you know apply myself. And then when I found glass blowing, it wasn't hard at all because I mean glass blowing is very hard, but the like the applying myself wasn't hard because I I loved it so much and I was just I just wanted to do it all the time. Um, so it was just natural for me to like work very hard because I love doing it. Um, okay. And I gotta give I gotta give credit to. Uh, he wasn't my he was my second glass blowing teacher bo hyun yoon uh he was from korea he was my professor and he after like just one semester of studying under him he asked me to be his assistant outside of class um and i was so flattered and that i think was um a big step in the right direction for me that's amazing um so yeah. what what was like apprenticing for him like was that just kind of like a like a straight up job um did you learn anything in that environment that was maybe not taught in classes that was like really valuable for you um yeah i don't remember honestly it was so long ago but it was just like he would when you blow glass you blow glass with an assistant at least one probably i mean i think there were probably two back then because you, you know if you're a professor you have access to so many students you have a lot of assistants um plus it's good for the students so why not get more assistants um so i don't exactly remember what we did but just um you definitely do learn more, obviously, but uh, also uh, just the fact that he like believed in me. You know, back then, I don't think uh, people weren't people 
I wasn't taking myself seriously, so other people weren't taking me seriously either, you know? <laughs> yeah, and, like, not gonna lie, it's, like, kind of tough for glass artists out in, like, the fine art world. Um, oh, yeah. Um, you know, I feel like, um, at least from what I've seen, like, galleries don't take glass blowing as seriously as some of the other mediums. Uh, True. Like, do you kind of feel that way? Like, have you, like, had that like kind of experience like in the art world yeah i mean uh i've definitely made a conscious decision to not care i mean like i do care but i don't let it affect you know like i'm doing these patterns right now that are uh like invented by and used a lot by pipe makers um and it's like kryptonite to any kind of fine art context it's so um heady and like people could say it's like very decorative and or kitschy but like i do not care like i love these patterns i'm gonna keep using them uh so i've definitely made a conscious decision to not care about that uh in one hand i can see the validity of it because um like it's weird to marry your whole artistic practice to one material you figure if you're if you're like a, a real fine artist you're going to use the material that best suits your uh concept um, and there's no reason why you have to be, like, married to this thing. It's a very craftsman way to look at things, very crafty thing. On the other hand, it's like you're not going to say the same thing about a painter, right? A painter uses one material. Like, why don't you make the same argument to this painter? You're like, why don't you use uh, plastic instead of paint, you know? Yeah, exactly. No one's, like, um, no one's telling these, like, painters out here that they should be uh, hopping in the ceramic studio and firing up a kiln. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Um, but no, I use glass because I'm I have the most skills with it, so I can best express my ideas with that material. And I do use other materials sometimes, but I love glass. Yeah. What What are some of the other materials that you work in? Um, I I've been doing a lot of video work, and I don't show it often because it's like I don't know, it's just for me. But I love I love uh, making movies, just like fun little animations and stuff. Cool. Yeah. Um, do you have like any desire to exhibit work that's not glass related at any point? Um. Uh. Yeah, I mean, indifferent. I guess I would, but I'm not. It's not a goal of mine. Mm -hmm. But I would if I somebody wanted it. Okay. Cool. What are some of like? your goals right now as like an artist oh that's a great question um uh this past i did the past two years i've like ramped up so um quickly i gotta find some stability uh in my artistic practice because right now i just feel like things are coming at me um from all over the place and i'm like I'm just like blown in the wind. I don't know uh, what to do. <laughs> um, so definitely get some stability uh, in my in my career would be good. Yeah, is that like for you like more of like a balance of like personal and professional life, or is it more of just like managing the opportunities and like business ventures as they come in, like more effectively? Like I I know some of my friends they have like. You know, they'll have like uh like two shows a year and like that's and like they they'll have like one artist residency a year and that's like their thing and like they've got like a good yearly rhythm. Like mm -hmm. I need something like that. So right now I'm I'm a mess. <laughs> <laughs> um Yeah. Um is that like do you think that's just because like everything that's been blowing up on social media that like now um a lot of opportunities are being presented to you or do you think it's like kind of been like a more of a build-up over time that now has like just exploded um probably the first i've been getting a lot of attention um which it's like i said it's very new it's only like last year maybe two um so, like, I could be a, a flash in the pan, a one-hit wonder. You never know. Like, this might just fizzle out in the next couple of years. Um, I, that's, that's a real possibility. <laughs> um, 
but it would be cool to have some standing power and just have like a nice, a consistent, a consistent rise in, I don't know, like how do you measure success in this world? Um, notoriety or like monetary success. Uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's yeah, I, I should think something I should definitely think more about is like, what do I, what's my ultimate goal? Yeah. What's your goal or like, um, how do you define success for yourself? Like what does longevity feel like? I mean, those are like, th those are big questions though for artists and things that like, you know, your teachers always try, at least for me, like my teachers always tried to prepare us for that. Like they were like, this is going to be a long game. This is a slow burn. Um, and it's, it's tough because, you know, it's like, like we were talking about with instant gratification, like you just, you, you want to see the result and like, you want to feel that growth like immediately. And, mm -hmm. um, but are you worried about this fizzling out or being like a flash in the pan? Like, I know. Um, I mean, I think it's a, it's a possibility. I'm not worried about it because my life was, was fine. You know, five years ago, I had a good life too. Um, being re being relatively unknown, um, so it's not. I don't dread that, uh, but I do love this. This is exciting. I mean, this residency, for example, is awesome. Like, I didn't realize how great residencies were until I have one, and now it's like, I get this is like the, it's like when you dream of what an artist does that's that like isn't a reality. But like when you're in a residency like this, it kind of is. Like I'm really just focused on my work, and I like, I go to bed, I wake up, I like think of ideas, and then I can like make them happen. It's it's so cool. That's so so cool. that's definitely like a short term goal is to get some more residencies because these are great. So let's talk about that then. What what is the residency that you're at now? Um, it's uh called a Tao Shi Chuan Glass Studio Residency. It's in a place called Jing De Jen, China. I can spell it for you. Um, yeah, I just, I wake up, I, I draw some designs and then I have like all the resources to make it work. And I do this, I'm doing this for like a month and a half. So, and you know, what's crazy that, that you don't normally think about is like uh, ideas, like inspiration. It's not like a finite resource. It's not like you have like this many ideas in a month, but it's more like, when you have the opportunity to develop those ideas, more come and it's like a flood. You know what I mean? Like you start, you start fulfilling them and one idea to lead to another and it's like a branching path and it's very, it can be overwhelming for sure. Yeah. Like I feel like that was me like for the first couple of years in undergrad, like where I had no responsibility and I was just there to make art and like exist. Like that was when like I had like the most like insane growth that I've ever experienced. What's your art like, Dan? Uh, I'm primarily a photographer and, like, video artist. Um, and then, like, over the last few years, I've been, like, getting really into collage. So. Um, cool. I'm I'm an image maker. So, like, I like focusing on images and how people receive and respond to images and then interact with the world, like, as a result of that. That's interesting. Any particular subject matter you focus on? Um, people? Like, I guess, like, um, so, like, it's either, like, documentary photography or, like, um, experimental video that, like, kind of um, talks about, like, just the mass media narratives, essentially. Mass media um, narratives. Cool. Like, so, like, you know, like, anything political, any, like, kind of, like, anything that's, like, kind of, like, a trendy way of, like, looking at the world or, like, how um any any news events and how those images can be taken out of context and recontextual like recontextualized based on what other images you put next to them mm, interesting that's like kind of how i approach like photo and video and then like i want to see it i'll share it with you i'd be happy <laughs> <laughs> yeah and how do you is this uh how long have you been doing this podcast for um so I, i'd say like a year um cool i started in like february of 22 and then i took like a really i took almost like a year off in between like because i got uh -huh. super burnt out um just on like everything but now i've kind of gotten more into the rhythm of like doing the podcast i've like started a youtube channel 
all with just like the goal of cool. like, uh, providing resources um for artists and like trying to like help create things that like weren't there for me a few years ago i love that that's awesome thanks <laughs> um yeah no i mean like that that's the goal so it's just like a been a slow burn to just try and like build on top of everything and also like find a sustainable way to do it right because it's like there's so many ideas there's so much like okay this video and then i gotta edit and then i gotta like cut clips and then it's like social media and that's, that's a lot on top of like still wanting to produce photography still wanting to make videos still wanting to like do collages still wanting to apply to shows and residencies mm -hmm. and do that whole thing which is like a whole job in and of itself you know mm -hmm. yeah totally i know what you mean it's a lot of work mm -hmm. um this is a great segue into social media though like um you've gotten a lot of attention on social media over the last few years um are you like primarily doing the social media like all yourself yeah i've had a, i've had a little bit of help with that um there's someone named ari from the gold her like uh handle on tiktok and instagram is the golden canvas so shout out to ari thank you ari she's the one who got me started because i would say probably um Two years ago, I was I was social media phobic. I was terrified of it. I was not posting anything. I still it's, I still have a basic aversion to it. Um, but I have to just get over the fear of like not, not not caring, you know. Um, and now I actually really enjoy it. Um, and I try to I try to think of it as like part of the artistic process, you know, to put out some kind of a fun artistic, like video or performance with the uh, with the piece. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, it, it really is important. Um, as far as like the marketing goes, like as far as selling it, if I wasn't on social media, there's be no, you know, I wouldn't be able to sell anything. Yeah. And like, are you like kind of really calculated with your social media or is it just like kind of whatever suits the work that you're making? Um, uh, it's a good question. Calculated. Um, I say calculated. I mean, like, are you like planning out like a content calendar? Are you like thinking about oh, no. like, using this video and like this piece versus like putting no, <laughs> no, 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 nothing like that. No, 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 absolutely not. No, it's zero calculation in that way. Uh, uh no, it's just like it's just like oh, I haven't I haven't posted anything in a long time. Like I better make something. <laughs> That's all it is. <laughs> I've been recently. I've been trying to um, take uh, style from. I, I love cooking. It's another thing I really love, and so I watch a lot of like uh, chefs on these platforms. So I've been trying to like uh, copy their style, their like video editing style, and apply it to glass blowing videos. It's actually cooking and glass blowing. There's a lot of similarities, um, and yeah, and they're so good at like making snappy like shots and like visually pleasing stuff. Yeah, cooking um, is like almost like ASMR at this point. Totally, totally. Yeah, I you know that's one thing that I'm jealous that I can't really do because the equipment is so loud in the glass blowing studio, so I can't get good like audio of. Honestly, I bet I could if I got like a good quality microphone and someone to get like right up there with the mic. I bet I could get some good. I have a Zoom mic. We can just like go up to your glass studio and just like have like use that mic specifically to get like some audio absolutely yeah you're based in new york right yeah i'm in um i'm in ridgewood queens oh cool i'm my studio's in uh gowanus okay awesome yeah but, yeah yeah come on by it'll be fun all right fuck yeah i would love to do that cool <laughs> um but um yeah you could definitely get like some good like furnace like some torch blowing like some glass shattering sounds like totally go i bet you have like a scrap bin or something that you like go through like you know all that oh stuff. there's a lot of bright sounds people yeah love, people love that shit like you could probably like, mm -hmm. do like a whole series on just like sounds in the studio yes i was thinking the same thing there's one there's one sound that's my favorite you take your metal tweezers you dunk them in water 
and you put a little drop of water on the glass and it goes and that's like such a good sound and then right after that you like tap tap and you you break it off it's like a, such a good little three second symphony yeah just like creating like a bunch of little prince rupert's drops and things like that yeah that's a that's another good one like exploding prince rupert's drops totally <laughs> Or the sound the Prince Rupert's drop makes when it goes in the water. That's a great sound. All right. We're going to write all this down. <laughs> cool. Love it. I love it. Are you a, more of a plan? Are you a planning? Are you a good planning I'm a main person, mind? Like, I, definitely, like, I definitely benefit from having structure in my life. Um, mm-hmm. My day job is creative operations. So I work... Um, I work for like a big brand company, um, really just like managing like the A to B process of like how like a marketing idea gets turned into like final creative and deliverable. I'm sure you've seen like a, a big growth in business with like the growth of your social media as well. Mm-hmm. How, yep, definitely. How are you balancing like being like the artist side of it and like the business side of it? Oh man, that's such a great question. Because obviously the goal is to just be an artist mm-hmm. and the business stuff is not... Um, not what you want to be doing, but I mean, some some business stuff is really exciting when you like develop a system or like do something that's working, and it's like business can be exciting and fun, um, but it's not like expressing yourself and making sculptures. Yeah, um, it's not the goal. No. Uh, yeah, obviously it'd be great to like outsource that part, uh, but I'm not there yet. <laughs> um. I'm sorry, can you ask the que- I forgot the question. No, it's all good. It's just like, how are you finding that balance between business and art right now? Right, right. Um, well, the, one of the best things about this residency is I don't have to focus on the business. I'm just focusing on the art. But yeah, typically, um, I guess that's one thing that's unique to glass blowing in particular is when you're blowing glass, you do carve out like a day, like a full from from 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. on this day, I'm just blowing glass. And it's you're, you're active and you can't look at your phone. You're like, so that's just like glass blowing time. And then like, as any artist or like small business owner, really, like the entire rest of the time is focused on the business side of everything. Of like, yeah, every, fielding emails, invoices, website stuff social media stuff, the uh, packing and shipping stuff, you know, all that, all that nonsense. All that, all that fun stuff. Yeah. <laughs> um, so are you, are you like a team of one right now? Um, basically, I mean, no, nah, I do have some like part-time help. Mm-hmm. Um, when it comes to, I mean, obviously I have glass blowing help, um, and like cold working, that's like glass grinding. Mm-hmm. And then like, uh, I mentioned Ari, she helps me with the social media sometimes. And now I have someone in, uh, who I hire very occasionally and Karen who helps me with like, um, I have like a huge amount of, uh, stuff that I have to do that I overwhelmed. Or like right now, cause I'm in China, there's some stuff that I can't do back in the States. So Karen will help me with that kind of stuff, but it's, it's um, like limited part-time stuff. So it's basically, basically a team of one, yeah, team of little one. one, one and a half a team of one with some like friends that you pay a little bit. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> exactly. Yup. Man, that's intimidating. Honestly. Um, I can't imagine like, like I can't imagine, like I'm trying to, I'm trying to get on that wave, but it's like, it's it's scary like um the idea of like relying on your art and your social media for your income yeah i guess so um yeah it's good yeah <laughs> oh my god i'm freaking out <laughs> yeah, i never considered this before <laughs> oh my god I, I just send you into a spiral while you're away you're like <laughs> I gotta get a job. Yeah. 
<laughs> no, I think it was honestly it was a a smoother transition because before this, like now I'm basically supporting myself by selling my work. But before this, I was supporting myself by just being a glass blower, which a freelance glass blower. So it's not like I had a nine to five job and now I'm selling my work. It's like I was just being hired per diem. Mm -hmm. They pay me a day rate, and then you know you go home and that's it. And then, you know, I sell my work every once in a while, maybe get a class every once in a while, um, and like hodgepodge it together. So it was, it's always been pretty unstable. <laughs> <laughs> Do you feel like it would have been harder for you to have the growth that you've had and like made this transition if you were working a nine to five job? Oh, it's such a good question. That's a good question. Um, Okay, so the, the honest answer is I'm, I've never, I don't know because I've never really had a nine to five job. Mm -hmm. But I think that, like you said, my current situation is this, not only the income instability, but also the scheduling um, instability is would probably be very uh, scary to somebody who's not either, it's extremely risk averse, you know what I mean? Because like you said, like, I have no idea how much money I'm going to make next month or um, what my month looks like. Uh, and obviously like, don't tell my landlord. <laughs> it always, it always seems to work out, but um, yeah, I think if you're used to like having, knowing exactly how much money you're going to make for the next couple of months and like that stability, that's definitely peace of mind that you might not have. But that's not, I guess that's not really your question, is it? I mean, like, it, it, I, I feel like you answered it in your, in your own way. Like you, you, like you, a, are someone who like can't picture having a nine to five, like, because it's like either not part of like how you like picture your life or like be like, if you did have a nine to five, it would be extremely limiting and then limit that growth that you've had. Like you wouldn't have yeah. the flexibility to just like drop whatever and go to China for a residency. Right. Like. You would have True. flexibility to like have like a nine to seven day in a glass studio. Like, true, like, true. You know, that totally answers like the thought. Yeah, yeah. Plus, I do feel like um, in this situation, I have I just have so much flexibility that I can um, explore the opportunities that that come my way. Mm -hmm. How have you been like fielding opportunities? Like, um, and what I mean by that is like. Are like how have you been like managing like relationships with galleries and like managing kind of like these uh celebrity partnerships that you've done i'm so bad i'm so bad at this i i say yes to so many things i just say no to and i say no to so many things i'm like why did i say no to that <laughs> okay so the two most recent ones that i'm kicking myself over um one of them is this like i'm Okay, I don't know anything about pop culture, celebrities, music, fashion. Like, I'm so ignorant on this, and it's 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 not good because that's like I'm kind of in this world now, and I have to be more educated about this. Some like big star asked me for a bag, um, and I should have known because she has like over 20 million Instagram followers. I've never heard of her, and and she she DMs me like so. I'm not gonna say who it is because yeah, <laughs> no, okay. she, she comes out. I think the first text is, she said is like accept my you know, accept my uh my message. And like hi. Not no, not no hi. No like no like regular human stuff. It's just like like give me this. <laughs> and I'm I'm supposed to be like, oh yes, thank you so much for asking. Like, you know, but I'm like, I don't know who you are, so I'm like, I'll give you a discount. And like, no, <laughs> and then later I learned who it is. I'm like, oh man, I sh probably should have just given it to her. <laughs> no, especially if they're like, I mm, especially if there's someone like with that status, like they can afford to buy one of your bags. Like that's exactly what I thought. And it and pisses they, me off that, no. right? No. Yeah. Like, fuck that. Like the, just, this like, woman's got millions, so yeah. many millions. Like Especially, she could afford it. Um... Like respectfully like the fact that they're hitting you up because they want it and then they're like oh i was hoping you would give it to me for free like 
get the fuck out of here. Like, that's like a it's whole gross. Yeah, that's hours of your life, like in the past, that you've needed to like submit to like be able to make this object that she wants a, yeah. to like look pretty on like photo with. So like, exactly. I'm not a millionaire, and you have like so. This isn't gonna. You know, I'm gonna like notice this like this amount of money that I'm asking for. So like, yeah, pay up and like support artists. Like, what are you doing? Come that's on. Okay. That's the problem is that we don't shame people enough for not supporting artists. Yeah, it's true. So many people think, like, expect, for some reason, artists, the work that we make is, like, uh, some, so many people think it's just, like, free for us. And, like, it's like, oh, like, yeah, like, just give it to me, you know? I'm I'm your friend. Like, I want it. Like, give it to me. Like, yeah, I can't not? do that. It'll look great on my, like, red carpet photo for you. Yeah. Like, That's one. And, yeah. No, the like, other one, which I... Oh, sorry. You go. No, you go ahead. No, you go ahead. You go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say, like, you know, like, if they're, like, going to use it for an event or something, they can fucking business expense it. Totally. Totally. Plus, like, I, like in the for how much money they're making, it's not going to, it's not even going to, they're not even going to notice. No, but that's they probably figure. spend that on, like, a fancy dinner or whatever. Exactly. But that's going to, like, help pay your rent and, like, keep you fed and alive. Exactly. Plus, like, you're getting this thing. Like, there's no reason why you should... You're the last person who should get it for free. You can afford it, and, like, you have the means. Like, I would rather give it to someone who can't afford it for free. Yeah, uh, speaking of which, I saw... When I was doing a little bit of research, I saw that you, like, gave someone, like, a heavily discounted bag one time, and they cried, you said. Is that true? Uh, yeah, I do vaguely remember that. Um... Yeah, that's true. I forgot about that. It was, that's the thing that makes it like, that's the best part of the job. It's like when somebody, when somebody like loves your work so much like that. Um, Cause like, you know, like as an artist, it's like your pieces are like a little bit of you. It's like a little bit of your, your mind and your soul that you put out there. And like when somebody loves it so much, it's like the, the greatest compliment, like the greatest compliment, and like that's the kind of person who I would, um, like would give a huge discount for. Like that's the best. That's what that's what it's all about for me. That's the best thing. Yeah, exactly. Can uh, because then they're gonna care about it. They're gonna treat it right. They're not gonna drop it ever. They're not gonna like tuck right. it away in like some corner with like a bunch of other shit. That's like yeah, that's a piece of art that they can like wear out. Like yeah. And totally treat it like that and they're gonna treat it like that treasured family heirloom that you talk about like wanting them to treat it like i do i want that something so cool to me about that it's like making something that um like you know your great grand your great grandma got this thing and like she's dead and it's like it's in the attic and you go and you like dust off this crate and you open it up and you're like whoa what the what the fuck is this thing <laughs> It's like the, that's know, my like, dream. Yeah, it's like someone opening the Ark of the Covenant. They're just like holding this bag. They're just like, what the fuck? Like, who yeah. had this? Yeah, like, grandma was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's awesome. Like, that's like, I think that's like such a an amazing desire for your work. Like, you most people don't picture their work like being dusty in an attic. Like, and you're just like, that would be the best. Yeah, right? Like, the reaction of, like, the great-grandkid opening it up and be like, what the hell is this thing? <laughs> That's. A, do you feel like you kind of, like, get that from your family's own, like, history with art and design? Because, like, I think I saw, like, your great-grandfather was in fashion design, your grandmother yeah. was a toy designer, and your mom also, like, runs a glass studio. So, like, mm -hmm. do you, like, relationship between like your family's history with like art and design and now like you're like i would love to create like a treasured object to be part of that yeah you know i didn't realize it until you asked the question but it's definitely true i think subconsciously that's why because actually the week before i left for this residency my grandmother passed away and um me and my dad and my uncle and my brother were like looking at her apartment like the the day after the funeral and there was so much uh like weird stuff like that um that like we didn't know what it was and it was just like 
you can tell it's like a treasured thing because she didn't have a lot in the end of her life, but she kept on to the things that were really important to her. And like some things were one one thing that I kept that I that I took home with me was a, a perfume bottle that was just like so 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 beautiful and so weird and so her, you know? Um uh yeah, and it's you know, it smell it still has like a crazy smell to it. Um That's amazing. That's beautiful. Like yeah. <laughs> no my condolences on your grandma, but like um just like the, I feel like the act of discovery for like family and their past and their life, like it's this like kind of beautiful thing that goes like unnoticed a lot. And I think it influences artists more than we care to admit, because I have a lot of stuff from like my grandfather. Like I have his like painting apron that like I wear in the studio. Like I don't even paint, but like I just put it on to like get in the zone. What your grandfather was a painter? Yeah. Not professionally, but he just, like, he painted landscapes and, like, drew all the time. Beautiful. Do you have any of his actual uh, paintings? I have, a couple. I have, like, a couple, like, landscapes that were done on, like, the back of, like, um, other pictures and stuff that he had around the house. Like, he would paint on, like, anything. So, like, um, I have a couple of those paintings. I have, like, his old, like, pipes. I have, like, so much random stuff. Like, that's just, like, for me, it's, like, yeah yeah that is that's a special thing to have like a a pipe is a great one that's a very intimate object a pipe is a very intimate object and it's also like something that's referenced a lot historically like true uh, there's like always like photos of artists with pipes or like artists painting using like a pipe as like a motif for like uh knowledge or like some kind of like status or something like that so it's like I, I also like try to think about it like that because if I ever want to use it in my art practice or use it as like an element, then like I want to like have like some like intention behind it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's good. That's a good one. Pipe. You hold it, you put it in your mouth, you like, you subconsciously suck on it. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really, yeah, it's very, you, yeah. The ergonomics of that are, yeah, it's it's all over. It's like your hand and your mouth, and you're inhaling it. Yeah, it's an interesting thing, the pipe. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, like smoking. Everyone is fucking smoking. Or like, I don't know where I'm trying to go with that, so I'm going <laughs> to... <laughs> um, so, you've been... Are you showing your work with any galleries right now? Or like, do you have relationships? Like, mm-hmm relationships with galleries um at the moment mm-hmm. How, mm-hmm. how did those come about and like how did you begin to manage those relationships because i feel like that's something that is like very like hard for a lot of people to figure out mm-hmm. um firstly i'd like to say uh kind of going back to goals mm-hmm. i would say before i had all these galleries my goal was to have like a bunch of galleries and i thought naively i thought well if i have like three or four galleries i can just focus on making my work and they can focus on selling it for me and it's just like beautiful little symbiotic relationship where i'll be making and they'll be selling it. it's easy and simple and whatever false i messed that up that was that's such a like a <laughs> incorrect goal i'm just gonna grab a little water mm-hmm. <clears throat> um now that i have them it's like i i don't i don't um they're not that va- these gallery relations are not that valuable to me. I, um, I sell more on my own, just through my website, and through, in person, and um, um, I do love my galleries, um, but they're like, it's not that important to me. Um, they all basically reached out to me through, um, social media, um. And for the longest time, for a decade, I was cold calling galleries, emailing them, messaging them, you know, walking in, yeah, uh, showing up all the time. Yeah, I wanted so badly. I wanted so badly. Um, uh, now that I have it, it's like, 
not that important. Um, it's not doing what you like. It's not doing what most people think it does for them. Yeah, you have to sell it on your own. Like being in the gallery helps, but you still have to do the legwork of selling it yourself. Maybe there's some great galleries out there that'll have sales that'll have like I think there are. I do think that I mean I think once there's some like great upper, ones. Like upper mid level and like upper like, you know, once you cross that threshold of like price point and like notoriety or like gallery status, like then it's like, okay, then they're really working for you because they're gonna sell like a single piece of work for like fifty thousand dollars. Like Right. True. That's like Yeah. To me, that's like the threshold because, like, that's at least what I saw when I was working in galleries. Like, it was the artists who were, they were able to sell consistently. Like, the artists who were like produce, but you know, at the same time, it's like the artist who's producing the exact same painting over and over again that they can sell like 50 of in a year. Mm. Like, this is well, over and, like, oh, dude, it's crazy. Like, there's like artists who are like, they're like, this is my bread and butter artist. Like, I am pushing their work on every client. I'm getting mm. like my 40 to 50%. And then like everyone else that they represent is just like, we'll see what we can do for you. Wow. And these artists are, if this hypothetical artist who's producing 50 of the same painting, are they doing it themselves or are they? Oh yeah. They're doing it themselves. Not... It's like, um, and you know, 50 is like, I'm exaggerating a little bit, right? Oh, okay. Like, it's like maybe like, 25 like four or like six foot paintings in a year which is like still like a lot yeah two a month yeah. one every two weeks and you know no, they're like 100 all, like almost 100 pound oil paintings like they're massive wow wow mm -hmm. the thing is if you do i don't care how much you love it if you do this exact same painting twice a month for a year you're gonna get sick of that like i guess you're it's, uh you know this hypothetical artist is like um they're an abstract painter so it's just like you know everything's a little bit different but like i'm i'm seeing the same thing up here you know yeah um, well but yeah no well, i'm not saying i wouldn't do it but it doesn't sound ideal no i mean like could you imagine like could you imagine producing like the exact same pattern on like every bag or like not experimenting with like the glass you're using or like not experimenting with like you know pushing your medium yeah i i did it i mean when this thing first started i was um doing the same bag i did the same bag 200 times and took me like a couple months um but what i would do is i would do that bag in the morning and then the last three hours of the day i would experiment and play around because i couldn't you know i can't I mean, there's no way I would drive myself crazy, you know? Yeah, it's like, uh, you know, it's like that's that's part of being an artist is just like wanting to experiment and like create new patterns and see how far you can take a medium, I feel like. Mm -hmm. Totally, yeah. Otherwise, otherwise, you're just like, you're just a creative agency at that point for yourself. One thing I did want to ask you about is I saw in an interview that you said you like to create your own board games. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I I have been doing a lot of that recently, uh, but I still, I mean, not now because I'm in China, but I still have a, a group with I meet up with once a week or once, it's usually once a week and we play board games at night, Wednesday nights. That's awesome. I love my board game group. Yeah, I love board games. And uh, I love the... In I love making board games. I love making board games. It's not so much the... Sorry, you had a no, question? I was just going to say, I have a friend that makes board games. So, like, I was super interested when I, um, when I saw that. Yeah, the interesting thing to me about... It's not so much, like, the, the art making of the board games, like the graphic design, all that stuff. I mean, that's great. I love that, too. But the thing that really interests me is playing around with the psychology of how different players interact. You know, you can assign people goals, you know, abstract goals, and then set up a system where there is inherent conflict and two people trying to, you know, get their goals. It's like the, the psychology. And then the, the most interesting thing part about, about it is you want to make a game that's fun, mm -hmm. which is such an elusive quality. Like, it's so hard to define what's fun 
And it's so, it's such a difficult and interesting challenge to manifest that. Yeah. Okay. That, that is interesting because I think that fun and humor are two things that are like extremely hard to like produce and manufacture. Um, totally. I think that it's something that is like severely lacking in art. Um, I couldn't agree more. Like, couldn't like, agree more. Like, especially humor. Like, I think like, I think you don't see a lot of art that like, in, like, you know, it's such a key emotion, like, but people are always like trying to go for like the beautiful, like walk in the forest or like the sadness or like emotions that are like, I think a little bit more accessible visually. Mm -hmm. um, but like humor is like so hard to do. And like, I also like, don't think galleries know how to sell humor. So I think that's part of like the issue of why we don't see it as much. Mm -hmm. And like, how come the best, best picture of the year is never a comedy. You know what I mean? Never. Yeah. It's under undervalued quality. Yeah. People don't know how to sell a joke or like a joke is like so specific that like, if it doesn't land with someone, they're just like, no, not for me. Next. Mm -hmm. wow. Yeah. That's a very interesting thing. I couldn't agree more. But yeah, just like something like that or like um, board game is like also something interesting or like games in general, something you don't see a lot in art. So like, um, you know, how like there are things that like everyone does and everyone likes so like how can like, you know, we don't access that a lot like in art, like play or like um you know, I think we do it in like our studios, but not so much like in these like professional viewing spaces or like in public spaces. Mm -hmm. Yeah, true. I thought I thought a few times about making like a like a fine art board game where it's like more. It really becomes more of like an experience or like a performance piece. Um, but like that's not what it's about for me. Yeah. No, it's like a it's um, a fun idea and like the board game is like more for like your friend group and stuff like that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, I mean, 90% of the board games I design it is I, I write out the rules. I draw it out. I, I map out the, the pieces and the cards and the board and everything. And then I never actually like produce it, like make a prototype about it. It's mostly planning. And every once in a while I'll get so excited. Like, Oh, this is going to be the greatest. And then I'll, and then I'll physically make it and I'll, I'll, play it a couple times with my friends that's i mean that's awesome like do you is that i'm trying to think of how i want to word this thought like is it more of like a hobby or is it more of like um is it part of like your expression is it just for fun like do you think it could like inform it because you're it sounds like you're making something just for the sake of making it and like that to me is like a key characteristic of it being like an art artistic or creative act. Yeah, no, it is. It's definitely, it is definitely an artistic expression, but it's not something I would or have any interest in putting out into the world. Uh, because like also visually and it's not, it's not compelling. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's super interesting to me, mm -hmm. the act of designing these rules and the parts and everything, but like to anybody else, it's just going to be like, what is all the, these numbers and these plans and these rules and these graphs and stuff. Um, one thing that I think there is some kind of parallel with uh, my glass practice and my board game practice is they both have a really weird, interesting mix of um, like uh, loose creative thinking and also like, uh, like tight engineering. You know what I mean? Like a lot of the stuff, especially I do with glass, is a lot of engineering that goes on in that and um, like mechanical design, like how it all fits together and the processes, how all have to be like meticulously planned out and stuff. Um, but at the end of the day, you want to make something that has this indescribable, ethereal, like human aspect to it. Same thing with the board games. Like you can make like a really tight board game that like works and like it's balanced and it, it's got a flow and like parts. But maybe it's boring. Maybe this is not fun, you know? It's like a super well-built game, but, like, that's no fun. And that's the... So they both have this mix of, like, tight and humanity, you know? Yeah, that, like, elusive quality that you're chasing. Yeah, the, the fun, the comedy. Yeah. 
No, that's awesome. Um, yeah, no, I love board games. I love like, I because just I I know so many people that are into like board games and role playing, and like I love video games. So like, it's such. I think it's something that like does not get the credit it deserves from like a creative standpoint, and like I just like so chill. Was so curious to hear 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 what you said. Say like we'll hear what you think about it. Sorry, it's almost seven in the morning for me. I think I've covered just about everything. Is there anything that like you wanted to talk about? Like that you feel like maybe like we didn't weren't able to cover? Mm. Um guess not. I don't know. Uh <laughs> I got two I got two new galleries I want to mention for anyone who's listening. Um one is Monty Gallery in um Los Angeles, San, Fr- San Francisco. It's in San Francisco. I'm so sorry. Not two gallery in San Francisco. <laughs> and the other one is Gallery O in Switzerland, which I'm excited. I'm I'm really hoping to take a trip to Switzerland because I've never been there, and it looks so beautiful. That's awesome. So I want to mention those two. Yeah. So shout out to those two galleries. Any other, um, do you have anything else coming up? Like, do you have any shows coming up? Do you have any like collaborations coming up that you want to promote? Um, I would love to collaborate with some fused glass artists. Um, there's a few that I love and I'll reach out, but if you're all fused glass artists and you, cause I, I've been doing some stuff with like 2d panels and I'm like chopping up and rolling up. Um, and the fused glass artists are the best at, 2d stuff so i'd love to collaborate with some of you guys um uh i got i'm gonna release so everything i'm doing here at this residency i'm gonna like release probably i'm planning on march 1st uh i'm not sure okay that's perfect i'm hoping to release this podcast by like mid slash end of february so it'll the time will line up really well cool yeah I would say I'm I'm kind of simultaneously working on three collections. I came here with one idea, but you know how it goes. I, I can't stay focused on one thing. One is all black and white. One has become like, uh, I'm making these like shapes, different kinds of shapes, and having the handle of the bag interact with the shape. I know it sounds kind of vague. And then the other one is like, I'm making tiny little bags, and I'm making uh, like baby baby versions of previous designs and some new designs that are like so cute and tiny like this which they're just they're tickling me they're really really fun <laughs> that's another one that's under underrepresented in the fine art community cute stuff <laughs> oh my god for sure or like uh cute stuff that's like really like in the world of like toys and like cause and like takashi murakami like yeah <laughs> yeah right <laughs> that's i'm definitely i'm hitting that i'm doing that definitely i'm definitely punching that hole you're in your keychain era (laughs) (laughs) totally keychain era okay um where can people find you online what's your instagram handle uh i'm rafey glass on instagram i'm rafey glass on tiktok my website is rafey.com R A I F F E, uh, yeah, and I'm in. Uh, also shout out to Habitat Gallery. Love you, Habitat Gallery. Um, shout out to Peace Gallery in Vail, Colorado. I haven't forgotten about you. Love you. <laughs> um, yeah, this is a real pleasure. I love talking to you, Dan. All right, thank you, Josh. Uh, let's let's hang out when you're back in New York. I would love that. Yeah, you should come by the shop. Hundred percent. I'm gonna come by the shop. That sounds fucking cool. awesome. Cool. Right. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Josh. I'll see you. Okay.